Um, some of them are, will be dancing, some of them will be singing, some reading poetry. Um, so it should be a really good night um, of entertainment, really. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our wonderful master of ceremonies, Mr. Reed Gordon. will be our very own Marissa Happernoon reciting The Fighter by my sister Woody Lloyd. She was always there to stop the hurt, even if unfair, always there to blurt, ready to take care. The woman I see, most sub stubborn of all, continuously bringing glee, there for every call, ready to oversee. Lending a helping hand was her specialty, making life never bland, this fight made her weak medically, yet now we watch her stand. She's changed my life, it's the little things that count, she made me see through all the strife. She is a fighter. She will always teach me lessons. She shines a little brighter. Thank you, everyone. And now, Marissa Hafner will be reciting one of her very own poems. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
Thank you guys for coming in tonight. I'd also like to now open the floor to Roger Jones performing something published in the this on page seven titled Four Little Fishes. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Man, fix that clock. Still had a hair past the frightful. Ugh. Hey, uh, calm down, everybody. It's not too funny. Anyway, this is uh, this is something I, I made, even though I made a stupid uh, pseudonym for it. I call the Four Little Fishes. The curse and the absence of presents. Presents that are left unaccounted for. Four little fishes swimming free at sea. See the dilemma that be. BCA is never to be corrected again. Again, I sit with the presence left in the black. Black and white translated as black and white. Light, light, slick bodies for trees to hold. Hold it. No, stop. No, please. Please from flapping fish. Eh. Please from flapping fins hold no weight. Wait, fishes' faces shouldn't fade blue. Blue blown will blow for a forest of five. Five star hotel degraded to two bit in. In the trees, poisonous fruit are tied. Tides to and fro, too far to swim to. Two feet up, never seen so high. Hi, welcome to greatness, wave Thomas Paine. Pain is all I can see, all I can hear. Here, strange fruit grow in any tree that can bear. Bare naked, measured on an oblique scale. Scales shine magnificently in the dew. Do all trees really grow that way? Way out of the forest, fishes are crossed. Crosses for the saints, trees are made of wood. Would that mean fishes are the real prophets? Prophets pay for ropes to keep fishes still. Still, knees grounded, wondering what's really real. Real myself through the absence of presence. Thank you, Roger. And now a little apprehensive, because now it's come to that point in the night where you've just seen some amazing works, and it's all great, and now I'm going to be up here going a little crazy being eight different people, um, reciting Max's Romeo and Juliet in 15 minutes. Now, for any of you who don't know the backstory on this, in freshman year, you have to read, as mandated by Bitterwood High School, Romeo and Juliet. And in our AP English class freshman year, Ms. Pendergrass decided for an end of the year project, we had to do one of like five things. We could do a CD, we could make a poster, we could make a tie storyline, or, as many of us did, condense the play into a 15 minute little skit. Now Max, being the comedian that he was, decided he was going to put a little spin on Romeo and Juliet and make it hilarious. Now without any further ado, I will attempt to do this piece justice in Romeo and Juliet in 15 minutes. Scene 1, a public place like Van Camp. Hot day. We should probably avoid being the Capulets. We might get in a fight. Bring it on! Here they come in. Where is Romeo? Getting you a chill pill, I hope. Wanna go? Tibble, I love you now. But I can't tell you why. You crashed my party. You're stupid. Hey, I'll fight you for those words. Bring it on, Mercutio. Oh, I can't say that at all. <laughs> Mercutio and Tybalt begin the biggest slap fight in history of the world. Then they take up knives and begin to fight. Hey, I got you now. <laughs> no, Mercutio, give me that knife. As Romeo takes Mercutio's weapon, Tybalt stabs Mercutio and runs off. Dies. <laughs> 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 Romeo 
Romeo's against the crowd. What? What did you do? No, you can't leave me! Then takes his friend's knife and follows Timber. Come back here! I'll kill you now! <laughs> Come at me, bro. <laughs> Romeo flees as the queen comes up to Bevolio. You're a nerd, right? <laughs> what happened? Romeo killed Tibble Tib after Tibble killed Mercutio, and then Tibble started it. So it's all Tibble's fault, not anyone's fault. Don't hurt me. I don't care. Romeo's banished from London forever. <laughs> Scene two, Capital Torture. Where's Romeo? I hope he's not doing good deeds. Romeo killed Tibble. Crap. <laughs> Mercutio's dead too. Is Romeo alive? He's banished. They'll kill him if he stays in London. Any contact is danger. Can you find him? <laughs> of course! <laughs> Scene three. <laughs> Friar Lawrence's cell. Romeo, you idiot! What did I do? The queen banished you from ever going back to the city. No! No! My life is over! <laughs> my life is over. I can't. Dude, you're 17. Get a life. Who's at the door? My Juliet's nurse. <clears throat> Romeo. Where is Romeo? Crying in the corner over there. Wow. <laughs> oh well, that's sad. <laughs> Find out what happens in Vegas. Go see the world. My world is Julia. You have you you have, you have to know her for at least a week before that. <laughs> Julia is doing the same as him. She brought you this ring. Oh God, who's gonna cry again? Go back to Julia. Scene four, a room in Capulet's house. So you want to marry my daughter? Sure, how's Thursday? What? <laughs> Three days notice? Perfect timing! <laughs> Scene five, Capulet's orchard. That was the best 30 seconds of my life. Well, I guess I can, I guess I can stay. Actually, no. Good, go away. You're lucky, you're pretty. Juliet, your mother's coming. <coughs> How are you, my darling? Are you still grieving, Tybalt? The loss is so harsh, I can't believe... Oh, whatever, you're getting married to Paris on Thursday, just an FYI. <laughs> I don't want to. Did you just say no to your mother? What? Did my daughter show backbone? I'll throw her out! You must marry! Come on, arranged marriages aren't so bad. You get money. <laughs> Nurse, what should I do? I think you should marry Paris. I hate you, get out! Maybe I should kill myself. No, not a legitimate option. <laughs> Scene one. Friar wants to sell. So you want to marry her on Thursday, Paris? Let's do it. Hey, Julia. Go away. I have to make a confession. You poor thing. I'll make you happy when we marry. <laughs> Goodbye. So, what do we do? We have to kill you. Duh. Okay, I got a knife. No, 
not for real, kids these days. Take these pills, and then you'll fall asleep and look dead for a day. See? People will think you're dead, take you to the crypt. Romeo's in the city of Marta. I'll send a message, and he'll come for you. Will this really work? Probably. Good enough for me. <laughs> Scene two, Paul and Capulet's house. You ready to get married now? Yeah. What, what do you mean? Oh, you said yes. Great. Thanks. Okay. Oh, you look so pretty. Scene three. Go to sleep. Big day tomorrow. Good night. This pause is potentially long. <laughs> now that she's gone, I can take my drugs. <laughs> Julia pulls the pills out from her pillow. Am I saying that five times fast around? Julia pulls the pills up from her pillow, Julia pulls the pills up from her pillow, Julia pulls the pills up from her pillow, Julia pulls the pills up from her pillow. Julia pulls the pills up from her pillow. Julia pulls the pills up from her pillow. You can't do it. Woo! Oh, what? Yeah! But what if this kills me? Or what if no one finds me in time? Oh. She takes them all in one gulp and falls to the floor. I'm gonna make so much money off of this. Oh, and our daughter's happiness too. Where's our daughter? Nurse? Go find her! <coughs> Juliet? Wake up! You can sleep when you're married, when you're not busy making sandwiches! <laughs> Juliet! Why are you. Oh, Adam. <laughs> what happened? Oh my god, Julia is dead. Oh, she's just <coughs> pretending. Look at her, she's clearly. Oh, uh, uh, no. What's going on? Oh no. I just said that! Why did this happen? My beautiful money! Uh, I mean, bride! Someone play an Avril Lavigne song, Take Her Body to the Crypt. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs>
mics aren't normally my friend, so let's go. So, in the spirit of being a new teacher, I'm obviously still in that love crazed moment, so I wrote about teaching. So the light of a teacher. I was told a teacher is like a candle, with a flame strong enough to handle the test of time. I never understood the relevance of this line. However, the truth was present the first day I began to teach. This was the moment my professor's far-fetched analogy seemed true. A candle illuminates the room, spreading its warmth to all in its reach. The flame dances around the room in excitement and passion. A candle never fails to shine. Reaching those hidden in the shadows, a candle passes this flame on. Watching as the light moves into new places, a candle has its weak moments. Where the light is dim, I hate it. It's easy to take two fingers and snuff out the light. Yet, it is just as easy to give it a breath of fresh air. Allowing, the burn, allowing it to burn brighter than before. Once again, the flame dances, bringing joy to those around it. It is passed on showing the impact one light has, looking at the dark space as if it were the sky on cloudless night. The lights shine bright in many places and continues to grow. It continues to shine and spread the joy of knowledge. Teaching is like a candle burning bright. Even on the hardest of days, it is the joy and passion one brings to the classroom. To help students see the importance of learning. It is the ability to see children continuously grow into who they are meant to be. It is about taking a it is about thinking about that breath rather than those two fingers ready to put out the joy. It is about shining down on the students hidden in the darkness, being the light that touches the hearts of all, especially the ones who need it most. So I will continue to burn bright even when those two fingers are close to snuffing me out because the impact is greater than I can imagine. Wonderful job. And now, continuing with our staff contributions, is Ms. Brinkman reciting some of her own poetry as well. and then one that I worked on last year that is very long, and I have just brought a very short piece of that. It's multi-pages, and it's a prose, it's a prose piece, a prose poem piece. So I'll go with a very short one first. It is called Shabbat, which is today. Um, two haiku for Kelly, Alex, Ivy, and I. Before the day ends, in the glow of the candles, we bless each other. Circled by your breath, in the middle of the night, I sing with joy. This other one, and this is a this is a fragment of very much longer work. The title of the work is called What I Hold On To, The Wholeness of a Broken Heart. November 6, 2011. Our daughter, Alex, turns 22 and a half today. Never again will I be able to catch my child running towards me so I can swing her up and around and onto my hip where she nestled so perfectly and contentedly into my body. Never again will I feel her little arms snug around my neck, anchoring me to myself. Never again will I watch my daughter dance with my mother. But the memories I hold remain. I hug them tight, and they warm my soul. May 8, 1989. My mother lays my newborn and bawling daughter onto her lap, where Alice stretches out, sobs slowly into contented sighs. 
arms splaying and fingers curling and uncurling into the air. I loved watching your infant fingers, my mother tells me. They were so beautiful, such grace. I long to be held by my mother. May 12, 1989. Walking down Church Street, my newborn daughter snuggled onto my chest, my body sun warmed and birth sore. I noticed the beauty of my child's hands in motion, incredibly tiny fingers moving miraculously, independently, each digit dancing in the air. Awed, I placed my hand near hers, close to my stomach, where just a week ago, her feet were kicking out. Her hand tightens into a small but powerful fist around my second finger, and my chest, in response, constricts and then expands. February 21st, 1993. In the car, I am trying to explain to my daughter that my mother may be dying. Does that mean I will never be able to hug Mimi again, she asks a rising panic beating against my ears. Yes, I say, my heart cracking. She is in her car seat in the back of the car. I cannot reach her. The keening of my daughter's grief shatters my heart, and the break is complete. February 22nd, 1993. Do you think there is an afterlife, my mother asks me, pausing. I answer, no, neither do I, says my mother. January 23rd, 1986, I am married and living in New York. It's my husband's birthday and I cannot reach my mother. I fear the worst and assume her dead. Reaching my father's office by phone, I hear over the line. There was an accident, a bad one. The car is totaled, but my mother is alive. Later, home from the hospital, my mother succeeds in convincing me that she did not deliberately drive her car off the road. She had, in fact, started to fall asleep. May 1995, two years after my mother's death, one of her friends tells me that the car accident was, in fact, another one of my mother's attempts to end her life. October, 1993. My mother is crying. I don't want to leave you, she tells me. My longing for my mother sweeps over me like a relentless tide. November 6, 1993. We go in to see her, my daughter and I. Alex is four and a half today, I say. I don't want her to remember me like this, my mother says, oxygen by her head her running from under the sheet. Umi, my daughter, the future director, says to my mother, remember that fall when you taught me how to dance at Jitterbug, the two of us laughing on the kitchen floor. I will keep my memories of you like photos in my head. And this is the one that I will put at the very top. This is the one that I will choose to take out when I remember you. This picture today, this one of you here, I'm going to put way down the bottom of the pile of pictures in my head. And I won't take it out when I think of it. November 23rd, 1993. If I were my mother, if it were my mother, I would make sure that she never wakes up, the oncologist says. Yesterday, I sit beside her, my mother, pressing the pain pump every 30 minutes until her screams silence into slowing sighs. November 28, 1993. It's 8 o'clock and the home help has arrived. My mother has soiled the bed. Her cancer has made her huge and she has sleeping bed sores. Claudette and I try to lift her gently, but we need help. I go downstairs to get my father, where he is doing a crossword puzzle at the kitchen table. Please, I say. I'll be up as soon as I finish this, he replies. Five minutes later, he lifts her by the head, holding her in his arms. Claudette cleans my mom, 
and I changed the shit, sh shit soaked shoes. I think she stopped breathing, said my father. Claudette calls for a hearse, and my father leaves from the hospital to operate. Claudette closes my mother's eyes, and I touch my mother's fingers, still warm, long, motionless, without beauty, yet also finally unclenched from pain. November 24th, 2011. 18 years ago, today, my mother died. I do not, I cannot believe that everything happens for a reason. I resist and I resent butterflies and rainbows and the cliched sayings that accompany them. The best that I can do is hold on to what I know to be true, the reality of the pain, the sharp and often wounding edges of our lives, the fluidity of life and love, and the freedom we have to choose which pictures we cherish and place at the top of our minds, the ones we reach for first when we think of those we love and have loved, and the pictures that we let lie at the very bottom. There is a Yiddish saying that there is nothing so whole as a broken heart. Today, I write about the wholeness of my broken heart. Up next, we have um, a talented musician performing two songs, um, Pride and Joy and Difference Maker. Up next is Jacob Douglas. Thank you. 
you'll be in heaven. Raise your hand, but shut up if you're not, cause I am.
All right, how would you think of our first dance piece? Woo! Up next, we have Whitman and Evenette and Ariana for a main hotel council. I didn't, which was, I was shocked, because I was doing one step, but also and I felt it moving. <laughs> and it was the same one as last year, and I was like, not today. I'm <laughs> sorry. And now, performing an original poem, which he wrote, I believe, in RFA, Bailey Pronto. tips of her fingers to the lashes resting on her eyelids. To the brows above beautiful voids, she hid that sweet smile away, but told me with those eyes that dissolve shelter under which I stood. She sheathes herself under a blanket, watching me drift in. She fits, wrapped in my arms as a child's doll. I hold her gently and still, with all caress and longing I feel for this fairy, who makes noise one simple tune to carry. Her eyes closed, she wraps herself around me. I close mine, feeling the pressure of her fingertips pulling me, loving through a thin sheet, close to her body. Unveiling her delicate lips, meet mine to embrace me as I embrace her, physically, emotionally, both tangible to us. In that moment, she disappears. Rather, she falls apart like soft lit like whispers. I miss her sluggish pheromones sinking me deeper into isolation, sickulation and sweet disgust funneling its way through my bedsheets taken with her memory. Our sweat burrowed home, previously welcome headaches, out of place now without her, as I clutch our shelter, no one in a full-sized bed. Wrapping up our schedule, I say schedule because after this there is open mic, as well as lots of wonderful pastries, desserts, yes. which are all delicious. I should know I ate all of them. I'm not kidding. <laughs> Closing up with the show tonight is Malik Dias dancing to Fancy Footwork.
Wow. Yeah. 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 Break my ankle six times. Break my neck five times. And would be in the ER in a coma for the rest of my life. Yeah. And you break the stage. Follows my neck, yes, yeah, so I would break the stage. <laughs> So concludes tonight's scheduled events. I do encourage you guys to stick around. The show it is not over, however. We will have some open mic and some free stage if anyone is willing to participate. If you want to see anyone of our best staff members over to the left, we'll talk to you this way. Thank you. This will just be a few If, if I have time and I actually remember, I'll you know, try to play James Taylor. Okay. Um, well, we got people out there, and you know, this is a perfect time to play my song that I know, because no one's here. And it's a lot. Oh, except for Jess. Right? We can't forget. Her. Uh, although she might forget this. I'm sorry about your confession, by the way. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, <laughs> Anyway, back to this. You know, starting off with a real Demi Downer on this song. You know, don't know what frame of mind I was when I made this, but uh, working on the title, I'll just get back to you when I have one, I guess. Anyway, uh, here we go. This town I walk in the rain In this life I live with restraints Not much more that I can sustain Oh, this bed is this searing pain
walk in the rain In this life I lived with restraints Not much more that I can sustain Oh, this there is this searing pain Oh, 
Now, Red Solo company events, receptacles, barbecues, tailgates, fairs, and festivals. And you, sir, do not have a pair of testicles if you prefer drinking from glass. Glass. And Red Solo Cup is cheap and disposable. And in 14 years, they are decomposable. And unlike my house, they are not disposable. Freddy Mac can kiss my rash.
All right, up next we have our own Maxine Kinder setting some Because they were my favorite, so let me keep doing it. 
not really a big deal. One day, before I realized fat kids are not designed to climb trees, I fell out of a tree and bruised the right side of my body. I didn't want to tell my grandmother about it because I was afraid I'd get in trouble for playing somewhere I shouldn't have been. A few days later, the gym teacher noticed the bruise and sent me to the principal's office. From there, I was sent to another small room with a really nice lady who asked me all kinds of questions about my life at home. I saw no reason to lie. As far as I was concerned, life was pretty good. I told whatever I said, my grandmother gave me karate chops. <laughs> this led to a full-scale investigation. I was removed from the house for three days. <clears throat> until they finally decided to ask how I got the bruises. News of this silly little story quickly spread through the school and I earned my first nickname, Pork Chop. To this day, I hate pork chops. I'm not the only kid who grew up this way. Surrounded by people who used to say that rhyme about sticks and stones. As if broken bones hurt more than the names we got called, and we got called them all. So we grew up believing no one would ever fall in love with us, that we'd be lonely forever, that we'd never meet someone to make us feel like the sun was something they built for us in their tool shed. So broken heart strings bled the blues as we tried to empty ourselves so we would feel nothing. Don't tell me that hurts less than a broken bone. That ingrown life is something surgeon can cut away, that there's no way for it to metastasize, it does. She was eight years old. On our first day of grade three, when she was called ugly. We both got moved to the back of the class, so we would stop getting bombarded by spitballs. But the hall, school halls were a battleground where we found ourselves outnumbered day after wretched day. We used to stay inside for recess because outside was worse. Outside, we had to rehearse running away and learn to stay still like statues, giving no clues that we were there. In grade five, they take a sign to her desk that read, Beware of Dog. To this day, despite a loving husband, she just doesn't think she's beautiful because of a birthmark that takes up a little less than half of her face. Kids used to say she looked like a wrong answer somebody tried to erase but couldn't quite get the job done. And they'll never understand that she's raising two kids whose definition of beauty begins with the word mom. Because they see her heart before they see her skin, that she's only ever always been amazing. He was a broken branch, grafted onto a different family tree. Adopted. Not because his parents opted for a different destiny, he was three when he became a mixed drink of one part left alone and two parts of tragedy. Started therapy in eighth grade, had a personality made of test pills, tests and pills. It lived like the uphills were mountains and the downhills were cliffs, four fifths suicidal, a tidal wave of antidepressants, and adolescence of being called popper. One part because of the pain, 99 parts because of the cruelty. He tried to kill himself in 10th grade. My kid, who still had his mom and dad, had the audacity to tell him, get over it. As if depression is something that can be remedied by any of the contents found in a first aid kit. To this day, his stick of TNT lit from both ends could describe to you in detail the way the sky bends and the moments before it's about to fall. And despite an army of friends who all call him an inspiration, he remains a conversation piece between people who can't understand, sometimes being drug free, isn't about addiction, but more about insanity. We weren't the only kids who grew up this way. To this day, kids are still being called names. The classics were, hey stupid, hey spaz. Seems like every school has an arsenal of names getting updated every year. And if a kid breaks into school and no, one's around it, no one around chooses to hear, do they make a sound? Are they just background noise of the soundtrack stuck on repeat when people say things like kids can be cruel? Every school, house, every school was a big top circus tent, and the pecking order went from acrobats to lion tamers, from clowns to carnies. All of these were miles ahead of who we are. We were freaks. Lobster claw boys and bearded ladies, oddities, juggling depression, loneliness, playing solitaire, spin the ball, trying to kiss the wounded parts of ourselves and heal. But at night, while the others slept, we kept walking the tightrope. It was practice, and yeah, some of us fell. But only to tell them that all of this was, was just debris. 
Left over when we finally decide to smash the things we thought we used to be. And if you can't see anything beautiful about yourself, get a bit of a mirror. Look a little closer. Stare a little longer. Because there's something inside you that made you keep trying, despite everyone who told you to quit. You built a cast around your broken heart, you sat yourself inside it. They were wrong! Because maybe you didn't belong to a group or a clique. Maybe you decided to think you last for basketball or everything. Maybe you used to bring bruises and broken teeth to show and tell, but never told. You. Because how can you hold your ground if everyone around you wants to bury you beneath it? You have to believe that they are wrong. They have to be wrong. Why else would we still be here? We grew up learning to cheer on the underdog because we saw ourselves in them. We stem from a root planted in the belief that we are not what we are called. We are not abandoned cars stalled out, sitting on an empty highway. And if some way we are, don't worry. We only have to get out and walk to get gas. We are graduating members of class. We made it. Not the faded echoes of voices crying out, names will never hurt me. Of course, they did. Our lives will only ever continue to be a balancing act that has less to do with pain and more to do with beauty. If not, um, I got your back, Tony. I wouldn't mind. I had a poem that I memorized for a class that would really, would really do well to follow up that poem, or that story. Um, Alright, so, beginning. There's still a gap. Oh, that didn't break. Oh, yeah. No, no, you were jumping. It was really funny. You, every time you hit, the dust on there just went flying up. I was like, yeah. woo! Well, it was like a. That thing can take off the head of a lion. Six. Like here. And when I. Oh, right there it is. It's right there. Oh, awesome. And when I started, I hit it, and my ankle moved, and I was like. So, sorry, I'm kidding. Is your ankle okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> this concludes tonight's. Do you no, want to do the future this, thing or no? Yeah, come on. Future, man. One last act to close our evening. Well, I just figured the whole of this staff wrote, we always do an Abby Amon piece, and we wrote a poem called Future, and we each have a stand there. It would be kind of a cool way to end. Oh, yeah, that's me. Even though our, we have a barely any audience, it would still be a cool way to end and have it recorded, right? We very appreciate it, though. Yeah, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you well, all for coming. Well, okay. And definitely, you know, pick up some of this. Everything that we. Everything that we showed Wait, up, you know, I thought it, I thought it, I thought it, I thought it, but, you know, emotionally, well, like, emotionally, you get up here too, but, like, mentally, you know, you know, our thought process-wise, this encapsulates, like, the best and the brightest of Bitter Bird High School, so please. Okay, Roy. Okay, Roy. Okay, Roy. Uh, okay thanks, Ben. He has a pocket. Yeah, dang. <laughs> the mouth, dude. Yeah. Much together. Much together. Gotta get all this. Feel the love. It's the rock nuts. So yeah, this is Paul. <laughs> yeah, he can do it. The rest of the world. Hands are a little. Yeah. You haven't seen the rally? No, before you kicked me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> oy, oy. So we do, we do, um, uh, we always do the last page of our abyss. We do the collaborative piece together. Yeah. For this one, um, Jeff Jones and I wrote a piece called Dear Abby. And we wrote it for Abby Amon. And then for me, I wrote the last page of our abyss. And we wrote it for Abby Amon. And then for me, I wrote a stanza um, of a poem. So they're very different, but the topic is future, so it's appropriate. So we'll read this to you. This isn't a sharpie I sent to the olive skinned stranger. It's a pencil. You can fix your mistakes. I gave him one and smiled. Now, standing above his last cradle, I've realized how wrong I was. People st still hold deep, dark grunges in the abyss in their hearts. Create a plan just so it can become un. Get it all done just so it can become un. Pretend it's known, just so it can become un. Then, realize it's not fun without un. The piece of paper in hand is the getaway. The skies are bright as it moves through the clouds. Stepping down and see these new faces in a new world, it's time to start something new. College, essay, FAFSA, future. College, essay, FAFSA, future. College, essay, FAFSA, future. 
Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> Look at, your, look at the stars, and you'll see the future. Glittering targets, hanging by hope. Infinite blackness, waiting if you miss. How do you expect me to leave? And I'm not ready to go. Where do you expect me to go? Well, when I'm afraid that you'll leave. Question number eight. Where do you see yourself in five years? Well, gosh darn it, maybe she won't think much of it. I mean, it's only the greatest rock band of all time. No vacancy! Oh, oh, she, she's looking at me. I think I'll just put down a T. A man fresh off the bus steps past dark gates and greets his parents with a wave and a seat flanked by tombstones. He hands his mother flowers and his father a drink and opens one himself. He sees his father trying in vain to rest in peace and asks for advice as he's done before. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming and definitely grab one of these on your way out. Spread the word. Um, we're a growing organization and we'd love to have you guys contribute to our next issue in the spring. So think about it. Awesome. Yeah, like that. Peace. 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 Peace.